So let's get started. So we're going to go to chapter 27, Gauss's Law. So I'll give you a brief uh, introduction. Gauss's Law is very important for us. If you recall, we did, we calculated the electric field of various objects like lines and disks and rings and stuff like that. And that involved quite a bit of uh, calculating using calculus and other things. Gauss's law makes it very simple. That's why it's important. It takes advantage of symmetry and allows us to do those calculations we were doing in the previous chapter, chapter 26. It allows us to do them very easily using Gauss's law. So once we get into it, you will see what I mean. So I'll start off by saying uh, Gauss's law allows us to calculate the electric fields. So this allows us to take advantage of symmetry. So by symmetry, I'll talk about a few of the fundamental symmetries. So I'll say in our study of Gauss's <coughs> law, uh, we shall utilize, we shall use a few symmetries. I will say particularly, we will use uh, line symmetry and the line symmetry is also the same as cylindrical symmetry and then we'll do planar symmetry so this will apply to plane surfaces or sheets of uh, charge and then we'll also do um, spherical symmetry so those are the three fundamental symmetries that we shall be working with when we do gauss's law and so since we are dealing with electric uh, fields we are going to start off by looking at the flux uh, the concept of flux so this is in chapter, uh, this is in 27.2, uh, flux, concept of flux, but I'll just call it flux. So flux would apply in various situations. For example, the flow of air through a surface can be considered a flux. A flow of water through a, a pipe, you can think of that also as a flux. Or the flux of electric, or the flow of electric field uh, through a surface uh, so we have various things that we can think of in terms of flux. Okay, so we shall start off by saying the flux or flux is a flow of material. So a flow of material uh, through a surface. And we shall say electric flux uh, refers to uh, the flow of field lines through a surface. So let's take uh, for example, so we consider a surface of area A, the flux of uh, field lines E is shown below. So we can say that this is a surface like that. The surface has area A this way, and we can say that the electric field can flow through the surface this way. So we have E going like that. So E is parallel uh, to the area vector, as you can see. So this A is an area vector. So E is field lines. A is area vector. And this is for the surface. We may also consider the surface the same way like this, but let's say the field is at an angle this way. So we have E and A. So the angle is theta between the electric field E and the area vector A. Or we can think of another area vector still the same way. This is A, but we can think of field lines going this way, E, going in an opposite direction. So we can define the flux for these three figures that we've, we've shown there. So let's do that by looking at the next section, which is 27.3, calculating flux. So I'll say that we can find the flux for these three orientations in the next section so in the next section this is 27.3 in your text calculating flux so let me redraw the geometries again so in the first scenario this is what we had so we had the area vector a and the field lines were e this way so in this case the flux through the surface is given by this uh, symbol uh, it's called phi, a Greek letter. So the flux phi is equal to the electric field multiplied by the area vector A. And I'm using the dot product. We've learned about dot product already. Um, so I'm dealing with the electric field multiplied by the area vector A using the uh, inner product or dot product. 
and that can be equal to the magnitude of E, uh, magnitude of A times cosine of the angle between the field E and the vector A. Okay, so in this case, since the electric field is this way and the uh, uh, vector is also that way, the angle between them is zero. So theta, uh, theta is equal to zero. So the flux is equal to E times A cosine zero. So it's a maximum flux when the area vector is along the same line as the field, the field line E. Okay, so this is maximum flux. Then we can look at um, the second shape, uh, the second uh, figure I drew er earlier. So we have the area vector A, and this time the electric field is at some angle E. So the angle was theta. Okay, so suppose we have field lines going through that way. So in this case, the flux again is equal to E, not uh, E times A cosine theta, okay, which we can just write as flux equals E A cosine theta. So depending upon the angle theta, in this case, the flux is less, it's uh, less than the maximum, but obviously it's not zero. Okay, so that will be the flux. So the first one, this is your flux. It's a maximum flux when the angle is zero. In the second case, this is the flux. And then in the third case, I'll draw the surface again. This is area vector A, but this time the field lines are going this way. So in this case, the angle theta is, this is the angle theta. Theta is equal to 180 <coughs> degrees. Therefore, the flux is equal to magnitude of E, uh, magnitude of A times the cosine of 180 degrees. Okay, so the flux is equal to minus E A because cosine 180 is minus 1. So in this case, the flux is negative E times A. Okay, so let's try a quick example on flux. So the example is here. So let's say what is the total flux through the cube. So let's say we have a cube that way. So we say the electric flux is going this way through the cube. So this is E. So the cube has six faces. If you like, we can number them one on top, two here, three is this face, and four is <coughs> the back face. And then let's say five is the bottom face, and then six. How did I go? Top is one, two is this side. Let me put three at the bottom and then four on this face. So this three goes away and then I'll put it somewhere else. So one on top, two in this face, three at the bottom, four here. So five is the top face here and six is the bottom face. So what we want to do is calculate the total electric flux through this cube. And so we can say the total flux is equal to the flux through phase one plus flux through phase two, plus flux through the phase three, plus flux through four, plus flux through five, plus flux through six. So when you're calculating flux, you want to find the flux through every phase involved. So this is the total flux. And so based on our definition for flux, the, what is the flux through phase one? Phase one is the top phase. Okay, so in order to do this, one thing you have to do is to identify the area vectors on the cube. So let's do that next. So let's do it um, without the electric field so that it will, look, it will be easier for us. So we need to know the area vectors and how they point. So area vectors on a cube. Uh, so let's say this is our cube. Uh, let me see if I can do a better job drawing this cube. So we have a cube that looks like that. So the area vector for the top face will point up that way. Area vector for this face will be this way. So we just look, if you can see the area vector is perpendicular to the face of the cube. Okay, so this is the area vector for that face. And you can imagine that each of those faces has an area vector perpendicular to it. So this will have its area vector coming out that way. So these are the area vectors. So once we know that, then it becomes straightforward to calculate the flux through the cube.
Okay, so the total flux of, uh, let's say, flux through phase one is equal to the electric field times the area vector for one. So the area vector one is that. This is two. Uh, three is at the bottom. This is four. Five is this phase. And this is six. I think that's how I had it. Three and four, six is the phase coming out. Okay, I think that is fine. Okay, so basically, uh, E1, so since now notice that we can put the electric field in, the electric field goes this way, right? So this is E. So E1 times A is equal to E, E sorry, E times A1 is E, A1 cosine 90. Do you all get that? Because E and A1 are perpendicular to each other, so the angle is 90 degrees. So flux through phase 1 is E times A1 cosine 90. The flux through phase 2 is E times A2 cosine 0 because those two phase, those two are parallel. See, the electric field is going through A2. So E A2 cosine 0. Flux through 3. So see if you can write the rest of the fluxes. So what is the flux through 3? What do you think the flux through phase 3 is going to be? Cosine 270. What? That's the one the no, no, no. The angle is the same. So the angle is just the angle between the electric field line and the phase. Here it's 0, here 90. So, so 90. yeah, it will be 90 degrees. So it will be EA3 cosine 90. Because the field is going this way and the area vector is that way. So the angle between them is 90 degrees. Okay, and what about the flux through phase 4? Cosine 180, very good. So it's going to be E A4 cosine 180. What about the flux through phase 5? What is the angle between E and 5? E and A5, 90 degrees. What about E and A6? 90, that's good. See, so now we have the flux through each, each phase now. So we can now calculate the flux. EA1 cosine 90 is equal to 0. So the flux through phase 1 is 0. Flux through phase 2 is EA2. Flux through phase 3 is 0. Flux through phase 4 is what? What? Minus EA4. Flux through phase 5, 0. And 6, Zero. So the total flux, which we said was flux 1 plus flux 2 plus flux 3 plus flux 4 plus flux 5 plus flux 6 can be written as flux through 1 is 0 plus E A2 plus 0 uh, plus, uh, minus, so minus E a4 plus 0 plus 0. Now, notice that since this is a cube, it means that A2 is equal to A4, which we can write as A. Therefore, we can say that the flux total is equal to EA minus EA, which is equal to 0. Okay, so the total flux going through that cube is 0 because the flux goes through one phase and leaves through the other so the net flux through the phase through the cube is zero any questions at this point okay so we can uh we can get into gauss's law next so having defined flux we've defined flux this way so we can use this next to uh to calculate gauss's law so we shall use our knowledge of flux to derive gauss's law and we'll do that in the next section, 27.4. So the main idea of using Gauss's law is that uh, we can calculate the electric field of very, some charge distributions very easily. So I'm just writing what I said, which is that uh, using Gauss's law allows us to calculate, calculate, I missed that, hold on a second, calculate the electric field of some charge distributions uh, more easily than using uh, Coulomb's law and so on. So more easily than Coulomb's law. So we can say that uh, we take advantage uh, advantage 
of the symmetry of the charge distribution. So let's start off again with flux. So we know that the flux through a surface is given by E dotted with A. And we can say that suppose we have a surface, let's say an arbitrary surface as shown below. So we have some surface like that, whatever the surface is, it has it looks that way. And we want to find the flux through this surface. So let's say at some point here, the electric field through the surface is given by E, and the uh, surface would have this element, which has a vector, let's call it delta A. Okay, so the angle between the electric field and the vector is theta. So we can say that the element of flux delta phi through this surface is given by uh, E dotted with delta A. Okay, so let's say this is electric field E, and then we can take the electric field is E, let's just say E, and the area element is A subscript I. So we can say that the area, the, the flux through this surface delta phi subscript I is given by that. So if we want to find the total flux through the surface phi, then we're going to take the sum of all the elements E dotted with delta A subscript I through this surface. So that will be the flux through the surface. So I'll include EI for this. Sorry, let's add an EI. That's the electric field at that location. So, so if we make the area elements, we make the area elements very small, then we're going to have an infinite number of flux elements. So those are, we have an infinite number of flux elements, delta phi i. And so we best handle this by using an integral. So we can say that the total flux will then be given by an integral of E with the area dA. So we've seen this before in the last semester. We said that the flux phi is equal to the limit as the, the area element goes to zero of the sum EI delta AI, and that is what gives us the integral of uh, E dA. So I believe we've seen something like that before. And don't forget these are vector quantities, and so the dot product pulls out a scalar quantity. So we're dealing with vector quantities here. So this is E dotted with dA. So this is basically Gauss's law. So what we have there is a surface integral. So this is an integral over the surface. So let's use this, uh, let's use this for, for example, the electric field of a charge. So this is Gauss's law. So the surface is called a Gaussian surface. Okay. So if we have an electric, if we have a point charge, we can see what happens. Suppose we have a, a point charge. So we shall use a point charge Q. I'm going to use the same notation as you have in your textbook. So I draw a point charge here. Let's say it's a positive point charge Q. And so it will have an electric field radiating from its surface that way. Okay, I think we've seen this before. So I can draw a Gaussian surface somewhere here. This surface is Gaussian. And the Gaussian surface has a radius R. So by Gauss's law, the flux through this surface is given by E dot dA. And in this case, since the charge is fixed and we have a Gaussian surface at some point in space, which is fixed, we can say the electric field is a constant. So we bring it out and then we have an integral over the surface area of that Gaussian sphere. And so we can say that area is just four pi r squared. So the integral that integral gives us an area A, which is equal to four pi r squared. So the flux, through the surface is just equal to E times A, where the surface area is four pi r squared. And this is what we found before as a definition of flux. And then we can now know, we can now take advantage of what we know for the electric field of a point charge. So E, so we know that E is just the electric field of a point charge Q. So we can write E equals K Q over R squared. And we know k is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, so we shall write it this way. So the electric field of a point charge is known and is equal to that quantity over there. So now we can go back to our definition of flux. 
So the flux through that surface is equal to EA, which we've already identified, and this can be written as E times 4 pi r squared, but we know that E is Q over 4 pi epsilon naught r squared, so I'll just write Q over 4 pi epsilon naught r squared and multiply that by 4 pi r squared. So we can take the r squared, the 4 pi away. So the flux through that surface is just equal to Q over epsilon naught. So we can now complete our definition uh, of uh, Gauss's law. So this is Q over epsilon naught where so Q is a charge enclosed in the Gaussian surface. So let's write uh, again phi using uh, Q in to use the same notation as in your textbook. So Q in just represents Q that is enclosed in the Gaussian surface. So that's a charge enclosed in the Gaussian surface. So we can write Gauss's law as follows. The flux is equal to the integral of E dot dA, which is a surface integral, and that's equal to the quantity of charge in the surface divided by epsilon naught. So this is basically uh, Gauss's law, the full version of Gauss's law. We're going to look at the application of Gauss's law next. So this is in 27.5, so using Gauss's law. So uh, let's see. So uh, we can do the first one, which is a basic one, using the uh, Gauss's law. It's similar to what I just did, but uh, I'll have you try it out. So let's start with using Gauss's law to find the electric field of a point charge Q at some distance R from the charge. So this time we are not making any assumption about what we know about the electric field of a point charge. We're just going to use Gauss's law to do that. So we have a charge Q at some point in space and we want to find the electric field at this point P. So this is the charge Q the electric field at this point P in space. And so the distance from that point P to the charge is R, so we take a Gaussian surface around that charge. So we sense the charge, we are assuming it's a point charge, we're going to use a spherical Gaussian surface of radius R. And Gauss's law tells us that the flux is equal to the integral of E, which is the electric field we are looking for, dotted with the area of the surface that we've just drawn. So this surface has area A, and that will be equal to the charge in the Gaussian surface divided by epsilon naught. Okay, so what is the charge in the Gaussian surface? So what is the charge in that Gaussian surface? What's the total charge in the surface? Let's look at it. What is the charge in that surface I just drew? It's just Q. The total charge Q in is just Q. So the so using Gauss's law, E dot dA is equal to the total charge Q over epsilon naught like that. Now the electric field at that point P and at any point on that Gaussian surface is constant. And so let's take E out of the integral sign and just take the, the integral over that area A and that will be equal to Q over epsilon naught. So what is that integral over the Gaussian sphere A? What is the surface area of that sphere? What? Four by three. Four over three? By no, there is no three. Oh, four by three. Yes, so the surface area of a sphere is four pi r squared. So we say E times four pi r squared equals Q over epsilon naught. You see that we, the integral that we have to do is just an integral over the sphere, the surface area of the sphere. So with that, we can now say E is equal to Q over 4 pi epsilon naught R squared. So this is the same formula we had for the electric field of a point charge, isn't it? Where we had K equals 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. So we were able to write E equals K Q over R squared. So we can find the electric field of a point charge just by using Gauss's law, as you can see there. It's very straightforward. We can do the same thing for a line of charge. When we did the electric field of a line of charge last time, we had to do a lot of work to find the electric field of a line of charge using trigonometry and different vectors. Okay, but Gauss's law makes it very easy. So we'll see how to do that next. What is it? 
So that's a k equals one over four five epsilon, right? Yes, epsilon naught. Okay, so we had an electric field of a line last time in Coulomb's law. We were able to calculate this. So suppose we have a line like that. We have charges on this line that way. The total charge on the line is Q and the charge density is lambda. So this is charge density is charge per unit length where the length is just given by L. And so we found here that we wanted to find the electric field at some point on this line. A distance R from the line. So that electric field is E. So if you recall when we did this with Coulomb's law, we had to take a segment on that line and find the electric field at some point in space and do all those calculations to find the electric field. Okay, so we can do this by using Gauss's law in a very simple way. We draw a Gaussian surface this way up to the point that we are interested in. So this Gaussian surface, as you can see, is a cylindrical surface. So by using Gauss's law, the integral of E dot dA is equal to the quantity of charge uh, Q in that region divided by epsilon naught. And we're just going to say the quantity of charge in, enclosed in that region Q in is equal to lambda L to make it simple. So the key then is to take E out again and take the integral over the cylindrical surface and say that's equal to lambda L over epsilon naught. So what is the integral over the surface area of the cylinder? Let's say the cylinder has a length L. Uh, maybe I should take the total L out of here and just put it on the cylinder to make it easy for us. So the cylinder is the length L that we are interested in. Okay, and the charge density. So we are saying that we can close the entire uh, line in a cylinder of length L. So what is the surface area of that cylinder? You know, who knows what the surface area of a cylinder is? 2 by L is per plus 2 by L. So we are just, the, the faces, there is nothing on the face. Oh. Yes, just the cylinder itself. The area? Yeah. Then, so okay. you got it, you, you got it right. You were saying plus something else. So I'm just saying that the area of a cylinder, let's say we unroll it like that. So if you if you unroll it out, what is it? Is it going to be L pi R, pi, 2 pi R? Yes, yeah, so this is L and 2 pi R. So the circumference is 2 pi R, okay, and the length is L. Okay, so it's the, set, the area is 2 pi R L. So we can say E times 2 pi R L, and the L, of course, is the length. Let me just put L there, and that's equal to lambda L over epsilon naught. Therefore, the electric field is equal to uh, lambda over 2 pi R epsilon naught. The L's cancel out. So this is the electric field of a line at some distance from the line. Okay, we found this earlier uh, a while back when we used Gauss's law uh, in your textbook. Uh, let me let me point out to you where this was. So this was on uh, this is the electric field of a line. This was on page 760. We got to an answer for the line, but when you bring when you calculate it all the way to the end, this is given by this same formula. Give me a second. Let me just finish writing this. So on that page 270, what it had there was uh, one over four pi epsilon naught. Uh, sorry, 760. On that page 760, they have that over R. And this is the same as writing uh, lambda over 2 pi epsilon naught R. So this is the electric field of a line at some distance from the line. We went through a lot of trouble when we used Coulomb's law to find this, but you can see that in just a few steps, uh, you can calculate the electric field of a line at some distance from the line without using any of those uh, trigonometry and things that we did. We just use Gauss's law and it comes out very nicely. Any questions up to this point? Uh, let's look at something else. Let me see if I can find something else we can do. Let's find the electric field of a plane of charge. I'll have you try this. Let's say it's an infinite plane. So we are looking at an infinite plane of positive charge with a uniform charge density sigma. 
Okay, so you can think of it this way. This is a plane, positive charge everywhere, in both the front and the back of the plane. So you have an electric field going out this way, and then one going out at the back. Okay, so the question is to find the electric field of this plane. Let me try to draw it better. So try to use Gauss's law to do it. Is that another one of the Greek letters right there? Yes, that's sigma. That's the Greek letter sigma. Sigma? Yes, sigma. So what you might do on this is to first of all find, take a small surface here near to the field, like a circular surface near to the field, so that you can take a flash through that surface. Okay, to be the electric field times the area of that surface. And then you take another one back here near to the plane and take a flash to that surface. So you have those two fluxes. So the charge density is the charge enclosed divided by uh, the area of the Gaussian surface. So what I'm saying is that take some Gaussian surface like that, area A on this side. Yeah, and then take another Gaussian surface, area A that way, and this will be just above a certain amount of charge. So the charge is enclosed in that Gaussian surface. So what you can do is uh, E, so the flux by Gauss's law is E dot dA. This is given by Q in over epsilon naught, of course, like that. Okay, and sigma in is just equal to uh, Q in is just sigma A, if you like, over epsilon naught. So for one of those surfaces, the electric field comes out. You take the integral over the surface, it's just going to be equal to E times A, and that will be equal to sigma A over epsilon naught, like that. Okay, so that is for one surface going this way. So you can take your A out, and E is equal to sigma over epsilon naught. Is that what you got? Yeah. And then the second surface, that is the same thing. So you have the two surfaces. So you're going to have, uh, so I should have done the two at the same time. So you have integral of E uh, dA1 plus integral of E dA2 equal to sigma A over epsilon naught. So I should have done it this way. Hold on a second. For the two surfaces. So you're going to have uh, 2EA because you have two surfaces equal to sigma A over epsilon naught. So you can take the A's out and you have E equals sigma over 2 epsilon naught. Right, so you have the top face and the bottom face, you are adding the two together. You are adding the top face and the bottom face together. Mm -hmm. So you have two fluxes. So remember when we did the calculation, we added the flux together. The flux is the sum of the areas involved. So it's, that's why I did it this way with the two areas. Integral of flux one, this is the flux through one phase plus the flux through the second phase. And that's equal to the quantity sigma A or epsilon naught. So you have the two EA. So it's EA through one phase plus EA through the other phase is two EA. So the electric field from that charge is E equals sigma over two epsilon naught. Okay, so this is like the field of uh, plates. So if you have a single plate with charge on both sides, the electric field is sigma over two epsilon naught. If you put two of them together to make a capacitor, the field between the plates is equal to a whole number, a whole one. So it's a sum of these two. So the field between the plates of a capacitor is sigma over epsilon naught. Remember, it was a uniform field, sigma over epsilon naught. Okay. Any questions at this point? Um, so we can continue. Let me see what we need to do next. Actually, we are almost there. So let me look at the field. Uh, conductors in electrostatic equilibrium and will be done. So this is section 27.6, conductors in electrostatic equilibrium. So when we started with this uh, class a few weeks ago, we found out that when you put a charge on a conductor, the charge distributes itself onto the uh, all over the surface of the conductor. 
And so we'll start off with that. We shall say that charge distributes itself over the surface of a conductor as shown below. So for example, we have some arbitrary shaped object like that. We can say that a charge is going to be on the surface of the conductor. I'll just draw it this way. And then I'll say charge is in that surface like that. Does the charge distribute itself? Yes, because the conductor allows a free movement of charge. So when you put a charge on some point on a conductor, it spreads all over the surface and they all go as far from each other as possible to reduce the, um, to reduce the, fo the forces between them. So they push each other apart. So at some point, if you take this surface like that and look at it with charges on it, this will just look like this electric field will just go away from the surface like that. Remember? And so inside, you're going to have some field lines going this way. But remember that by symmetry, there is going to be another electric field coming from this side. So since the surface is closed, there's another surface here where, which has field lines like that. And these field lines are pointing away outside like that. But inside, they cancel each other out. So what you have then is that inside a conductor, the electric field is zero, and there's an electric field outside a conductor which points in all directions. The field lines, of course, are going to be perpendicular to the surface. So E is equal to zero inside. Okay, I'm just drawing a portion of this. I'm saying that E is equal to zero inside a conductor. So this we can take advantage of this kind of, uh, this, this by using this as a shielding, tool. So knowledge of the electric field inside a conductor can be used uh, to design uh, electrostatic shields as shown below. So for example, we want to find that we do an electrostatic shield. We can say that, let's say we have two plates like that. This is a positive plate and a negative plate. The electric field goes from one plate to the other this way. If we put a conductor between these two plates, Let's say this is a conductor like that. The electric field is going to go like that, and it will go to the surface that way, that way. So the set, the electric field on the conductor is shielded. Whatever is in here is shielded from the electric field outside. So this is a conducting surface in here. It will be to be shielded. So this conducting surface will have negative charges here, positive here, like that, and so. Inside, you have an electric field going from right to left. On the outside, the electric field goes from left to right. So the outside electric field cancels what is on the inside. And so the electric field inside, the, uh, inside there is going to be zero. So this is uh, an effective way of shielding some object, uh, something you know, which is sensitive to electric fields. You can shield it by putting it between in a conductor. Okay, so this is uh, the end of that, of that chapter.